Hello, and welcome to the Social Purpose Exchange. My name is Sean Mallon. Here's a proposition that is turning the business world on its head. An obsession with delivering profit for shareholders above all other considerations isn't necessarily such a great business model anymore. Customers, communities, employees, and even some shareholders are now demanding that corporations do better, that they make a real and meaningful contribution to improving society. That's social purpose. And the Social Purpose Exchange is a forum for what we hope will be provocative, enlightening conversations about this concept that is revolutionizing the business world. Our guest on this edition is Kevin Page, who first came to prominence as Canada's first uh, parliamentary budget officer, a job in which he regularly disagreed with the decision makers and regularly in the news. He is now the founding president and CEO of the Institute of Fiscal Studies and Democracy at the University of Ottawa. Welcome to the Social Purpose Exchange. Good to be here, Sean. Let's start by talking about your, your new venture. What is the, the Institute for Fiscal Studies and Democracy? What's that all about? It's a small independent nonprofit that's you know, situated at the University of Ottawa that um, that looks at that nexus of issues between public policy and public finance, and you know the role that institutions play in terms of promoting healthy public policy and healthy public finance. And also, it's an institute that works with students, our next generation of leaders. And um, yes, yeah, we've been in business for about three years. What role would you like it to play? Yeah, but really, I think for me, it's really about preparing the next generation of leaders. And um, yeah, you know, I think just with the issues that come up, we want to be present. Like, you know, whether the issues are like, what does 21st century infrastructure look like, or like, how do we get better funding formulas for First Nations child welfare, or like, you know, what would you know, how would we reduce drug prices and you know, increase coverage for for pharmaceuticals in the country? So, if those are the big pu public policy issues, we want to be focused on those as well. All of which, of course, are great um, uh, social issues that in some ways intersects with the concept of corporate social purpose. So we ask each of our guests to talk about what their definition of the concept of social purpose is. What's yours? I mean, I, I, I look at this issue a little bit as somebody that wasn't you know, a former macroeconomist and somebody that would have studied you know, the um, like the corporations and the role in the marketplace. And so I think for you know, somebody that kind of grew up studying economics in the 70s and 80s, uh, there was a former Nobel Prize winner, like Milton Friedman, was very popular and developed something called, the, you know, the Friedman Doctrine, and really, like, really highlighted for economists and maybe simplified our world, maybe too simplified, saying that, that corporations are really there to, to make profits uh, for their, sh you know, for shareholders. And I think, like, you know, over the past 10 years, and maybe particularly since the financial crisis, but maybe even a little bit before, people we're starting to broaden the definition. Well, what, like, what is you know the purpose for, of corporations beyond um, you know beyond making profits? And you know, the companies of all ilk have different purposes. And you know, can these corporations and should these corporations provide? Uh, should there be a public purpose? So I think yeah, corporate social purpose. I think it looks at could you know what are the responsibilities and obligations of corporations to deal with issues that that go beyond profits that speak to. You know, potentially the environment or social good or governance and yeah so I mean there's a lot of literature now on corporate social purpose. Is there strong evidence that it's also a good bottom line proposition as well to deliver long-term value to its shareholders as well? Yeah, I think there's definitely there's evidence on a kind of company basis um, that you know you've seen companies you know that moved in you know in this direction in a very strong ways I think you know, people of our generation, they, you know, we're, you know, I think we were quite mindful of what kind of goods we're buying in this environment. I think, you know, we read the news and we hear, you know, we see the devastating effects of climate change and the cost of adaptation, or we, you know, we see the rise of populist leaders in different countries and we ask ourselves, like, why is it that, you know, we see these sorts of negative populist leaders, or why have we seen the hollowing out of certain, you know, big cities? And so, again, we want to know these companies, how are they operating? And um, yeah, if I could promote, if I go to a coffee shop, I prefer to buy coffee from, a, you know, a company that is um, promotes fair trade, and coffee beans. If you know, if I'm buying a car now, I'm looking at cars that are that you know that are reducing carbon footprint, that are hybrids or electrics. So I think it's becoming very, you know, part of this the, the way we purchase goods now. Do you think it's that kind of message can seep through the? 
Friedman-esque generation of CEOs and uh, those who follow that kind of doctrine to, to recognize that that's a good long-term proposition? I mean, sometimes, you know, to bring about real change, you, you almost need a crisis. And I think um, there's definitely this talk of corporate social purpose goes, goes far back. There's examples of companies that, that have existed that are, um, you know, hundreds of years old that you definitely are, are renowned for public purpose. But I think really since the financial crisis, the breakdown, you know, and just, um, you know, of, you know, the financial markets and a lot of these sort of very big ethical kind of scandals, where companies have played with their balance sheets, that um, you know, I th yeah, I think it, it's taken a lot of prom promise, and I think people want a different type of behavior than, that is more ethical. You know, for corporations, we see low trust in corporations when we look at these public opinion polls. And we see the same in government as well. So, how important do you think it is for corporations to, to take this on, to take on social purpose, and show that they're really making a difference? I think it's, uh, again, in the environment of low trust, I think it's extremely important. And for companies that, um, that have existed for a long period of time and need to change their ways, it's, that's a real struggle. But I think it's a struggle that they need to do. For startup companies, you know, perhaps uh, that we see, and we see just enormous growth of startup companies, particularly in technology companies in the recent time, to start with this sort of idea that, you know, you, that these pr practices of corporate social purpose whether it's the environment or it's social, it's or it's deals with their labor force. I think it's it's. I think in some ways it's a lot easier because you start with a blank sheet of pa paper. I think for the 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 new generation, I'm somebody that spends time at the University of Ottawa, so I spend my days with students. It's just like fundamental. They They're see demanding this, it. They see it's the future, and so they are quite frustrated when they don't see. Um, progress on issues like climate change or even homelessness and they see political leaders or business leaders kicking the cans down the road on these big issues so Greta Thunberg writ large I guess absolutely yeah is there some potential link between between the Institute you lead now and the concept of social purpose in the broader community can you be contributing to it somehow I think there is Sean and um, Recently, you know, we saw through the release of mandate letters by the new government, Prime Minister Trudeau's government, that the, um, one of the mandate commitments for the Parliamentary Secretary of the Department of Finance is to look at indicators of well-being. And it's, it's, you know, this concept is prefaced from budgets that we've seen in other parts of the world, including, um, including you know, New, uh, New Zealand and um, Scotland in particular, where they've actually kind of started to reframe the language around budgets, which have turned out to be these like four or five hundred page documents um, that people have a hard time to follow. And, and I think with like, what they're trying to get at, I think Canadians have a hard time understanding balance sheets and, and just, you know, governments that come out and said we're going to spend the following additional amounts of money on housing or the following additional amounts of money on First Nations child welfare. But they want to know, like, what are the outcomes? Are the outcomes actually getting better? Are we seeing, you know, um, are we actually seeing a reduction in the number of homeless people? Are we seeing uh, improvements in the lives of children in First Nations communities. So these are the indicators they want to see in the budget. And these are called these are, you know, indicators of well-being. And I think there's been leaders, and you know, Mrs. Merkel was one from Germany who said that, like, you know, we're going to see more and more of these sort of negative populist leaders unless governments can find ways to communicate directly to citizens. And I see this as a, a very much a parallel with what uh, corporate social purpose is getting at and social audits are getting at. So what are you know, people want to know, like, what, are, what good are actually these companies are doing in, in addition to providing profits? And uh, to the extent that they're not doing good and they're promoting bad practices, they want that stop. So I think, again, there's a reframing going around, and I think the broader issue is, is trust. And, and governments and corporate leaders, they, they need trust, actually, to survive, and I think that's where we find ourselves. And to get trust, you have to demonstrate results, effectively, both. That's what you're talking about, isn't yeah. it? And I think this, we are, so we're finding ways for corporations, you know, perhaps through changing corporate laws, but through corporate reporting, building different relationships between management and shareholders uh, to kind of know that this is front and center to purpose. And, you know, these investments sometimes to bring about big changes, uh, whether it's in mental health in the case of Bell or... Uh, for the government, say, in, in the, you know, long-term reductions in homelessness or real improvements in the well-being of First Nations children. Like, it, these are longer-term investments. So having these indicators and putting them front and center, then we could see whether there's progress taking place over time. Yeah, it's pretty easy to make the promise, but you need to be able to show you've delivered 
on real uh, on real change. Yeah, so we should see these indicators every year, and, and you know, again, you know, if social audits, I don't know if they have to be done every year, but maybe every couple of years for companies, and yeah, but the commitment, is, you know, through over time, would be is I think really what we need in this environment. When you have people like Larry Fink of BlackRock or Mark Carney speaking up about these kinds of issues, does that indicate to you that? Perhaps the message is getting through that perhaps this might be a, a wave that's unstoppable. Yeah, I don't know if it's unstoppable yet, um, but it's definitely it's a significant wave, and um, like it's it's uh, yeah, and to have leaders of, you know of Finch or Carnage, but like talking in this way, and others, um, you know, there's researchers as well at different universities across the world, including people like Colin Merritt at the University of Oxford. So there's enough, like there's a kind of a critical mass speaking about it. Um, is it, you know, is it, you know, is it, are we, is it a revolution that is taking off? It, it, it's th I think that's a little bit premature. Um, but, you know, I think companies are, you know, understand that, um, that trust is an important part of their capital. There's a social capital to, that goes along with their material capital and, and financial capital and that, you know, that, um, it's important for their balance sheets as, as you know as, as the sustainability of their business. In your previous position, you were all about transparency and honesty in public finances, telling telling the real fact-based story, not always to the great pleasure of the finance minister of the day. Is that a kind of lesson and an, an ethos that can that should be an important part of social purpose? Do you think? I think um, I think there's I mean I think transparency is um, is a, like a necessary condition for trust. It's hard to really engender, you know, long-term trust without you know some trans. People want to be able to know what people are up to, and yeah. So um, yeah, I think it's important. I think it's we. I think like people like myself have a, a, a sort of a bent that we like to measure things, and uh, we're not quite at that stage. Like to go back to your first question, like is it really having an impact? be pretty hard at this stage right now to say as a macroeconomist that this is the impact. It's, you know, for the companies that have taken on, um, you know, corporate social purpose and that have opened themselves up to social auditing that, you know, this has been the impact to well-being, this has been the impact to, to GDP, this has been the impact to jobs. We're not, I don't think we're quite there yet. Um, but, you know, thanks to those leaders that you mentioned, Finch and Carney and others, that I think we're definitely well along the, the journey. Frequently cited example is Bell and the Let's Talk campaign for mental health. Do you think something like that has had a manifest benefit for Bell? And I'm wondering if you have any other case studies that you that come to mind for you of companies that have shown real commitment to social purpose where it's done their done them real benefit. I think it's, you know, it's obviously, um, like I could connect with Bell's. I mean, I've had, like in my family, we've had mental health issues. My sister's schizophrenic. Um, I, I'm a former co-chair of the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness. There are a lot of people find themselves on the street that are just dealing with mental health issues. I have spent time with cabinet ministers uh, for public safety that tell me that what keeps them up at night is really knowing that you know we're putting we're incarcerating people that are not real criminals but are really dealing with mental health issues. So like I totally applaud what Bell is doing. I, I think like that is definitely one model. Yeah, you know, I think the other model is that um, I mean, companies, whether they're they could be car companies or pharmaceutical companies. Technology companies, I think building the you know social purpose, you know not necessarily you know, the purpose of Bell as a utility isn't like primarily focused on mental health, but obviously they have employees. We want to make sure that Bell employees are are doing well, and you know they obviously are contributing to the community. But I think it's the other model is just to make sure that the companies that their practices um, are in keeping with um, you know strong you know, public you know public good good social practices, a stronger environment, they're reducing their carbon footprint. Um, that they are, you know, that they're, 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 you know, the way they treat their employees, whether their employees are located in Canada or, you know, in a developing country, that you know that you know they're being treated humanely, and um, yeah, to the extent that companies like Bell could, in addition to that, could actually take on a challenge to help their community, um, I think it's it's terrific. It takes pressure off the government, which leads into my next question because there's a bit of creative tension here about and some concern about if companies really step up in this way, the corporate leadership steps up in this way, that perhaps they might, some concern that they might be subverting the role of government and some suspicion about what their motivations are about that. What are your thoughts about that, the tension between uh, private enterprise getting involved with these things versus what government should be doing? Well, I think if there is a tension, I would say it's a very healthy tension. 
that, um, yeah, definitely governments, you know, have a different role. They bring people together to promote, like, public welfare, public good. And, um, you know, to the extent that corporations, they would take on, like, a corporate social purpose. Um, it actually would take some pressure off governments, like, using regulatory tools to make sure that they're not harming the environment or they're treating, you know, labor with labor codes or practices that they're treating their employees fairly and humanely. So I think it really, it would, it would be a very healthy tension. I think we really we need it now more than ever. It just I think we find ourselves at a period of time where, um, you know, because of climate change, I think people are more and more realizing that this is like happening now. It's it's I think it's scared, it's scared scientists how fast it's coming up up to us. But I think even citizens, you know, that you know that have you know had to embrace these incredible storms. I live close to a river. We've had uh, you know two major floods in, in the Ottawa River in the past three years. So, like we just see the frequency of this, and also we watch it on TV. Whether it's you see the, the power of these storms to the Caribbean, et cetera. So, like I, I actually see it as very complementary. And I think if we're going to tackle climate change, if we're going to tackle the issues of you know of technology and labor markets, that we will need like how the, these two sectors working together in a, in a much better way than the past. So it's a good tension. And is there a need, really, given uh, there's also a level of mistrust of the corporate level, uh, uh, corporate leaders, more so in the United States than here, but of, of uh, pernicious motives of working behind the scenes to influence government policy to their own benefit and not so much to the people at the lower end of the spectrum. Is there a real need for them to, you know, clean up their image a bit and then show that they're contributing to society? I think there is. I think, and again, I think that applies equally to the government as well. That we're just we live in times of low trust, and that there is a cost to this. And so, yeah, if corporations, or, you know, whether this, you know, is like kind of heartfelt, like this move to corporate social purpose, or whether this is just like you know the, uh, part of a broader change that they have to jump onto it. I think you know whether it's one force or the other force, it's still moving in the right direction. In your time in government, you were all about, as we said, uh, honest appraisal of what uh, the fiscal situation was. If we're measuring the social purpose of a company and the effectiveness or the legitimacy of it, what are your thoughts about how to develop metrics so people can actually trust it? In other words, to understand that a company is really delivering on something and not greenwashing or just yeah. uh, uh, giving lip service to something. Yeah, I think there's 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 been some advances on on um, you know thanks to you know this the, the work that is being done on social auditing and some of these the B listing of companies. So there's there's been definitely like some forward progress on on measurement, and I think to the extent that um, like it, that this is being done independently of the company, that um, I think it promotes a sense of confidence that. The you know the metrics and the observations around those metrics are actually they're, they're useful. So um, I can, again, I, you know, I'm somebody that head up an independent you know, parliamentary budget office, and I think that independence was the sine qua non of the, doing the job. I think when we put the information out and we showed our work and it was, we were and our numbers and our assumptions, that, that carried a certain weight, and you know, the government had to respond. I think. It's made them uncomfortable at times. It, yeah, if it, yeah, sometimes it, it did. And I think it's already, they think there's some evidence that companies, when they put themselves out to these sorts of social audits, that their initial scorings are not so good, and the ones that stay with it find ways to improve. And that progress is quite healthy. Okay, we'll end on that. Thanks very much, Kevin Page. Thank you, Sean. And that's the Social Purpose Exchange. Thanks very much for watching. This also exists as a podcast, so we invite you to check it out wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Sean Mallon. We'll see you next time.